The gap between male and female criminals is unbelievably wide. For instance, do not let statistics push you into believing that crime is gender-specific. History is littered with women who have proven otherwise. From a woman whose killings were so macabre that some even speculated that she was Jack the Ripper to another who stole more money than gangs such as Bonnie and Clyde, John Dillinger and Vern Miller combined. In today's video, we'll be looking at the 10 most dangerous female criminals. And at number 10 is a woman so evil she was known as Belle's Hell, Belle Gunness. Although widely known as Belle Gunness, this criminal was born Brynhild Paulsdatter Storseth on November 11, 1859 in Norway. She was the youngest daughter in a family with eight kids born to Paul Pedersen, a stonemason and his wife. Now, after working as a servant for years in 1881, Belle Gunness arrived in the United States from Norway in search of the proverbial greener pasture. Although she started out as a servant, she soon developed a taste for wealth and power. Her path to fortune began with a marriage in Chicago that led to her and her husband opening a candy store. Not long after opening the store, quote-unquote, tragedy struck. The store and their house got burned down mysteriously, granting them a hefty insurance payout. Now, whether Belle caused the fire or simply saw an opportunity out of it, no one could tell, but that was what started the ball rolling for her. Soon after, her husband met an untimely demise from heart failure. Before his death, the couple had four children who at this time became nothing but potential bags of insurance money for her. First, two of the children met tragic ends from mysterious causes, providing her with even more insurance money. After this, she bought a farm which became her base. She would later remarry to a man who had two daughters. Unfortunately, the same dark fate befell them too, and she got the insurance money again. Later, Belle turned her attention to wealthy suitors, luring them in through the lovelorn column of newspapers. One by one, these unsuspecting men vanished without a trace. Concerned voices rose in the wake of their disappearances, prompting the brother of one of the missing suitors to launch an investigation. By the time the investigation began, Gunnis had disappeared nonetheless. The investigation led to chilling discoveries. When the investigators got to her farmhouse, they were prompted to do some digging. This at first uncovered four bodies, skillfully sliced apart and wrapped in oilcloth. One of them was identified to belong to the missing suitor, but as they continued to dig at her hop pen, they continued discovering bodies one after another. Now, although Belle Gunness masterminded it all, she didn't do it all alone. She had a handyman named Ray Lamphere, who she later sacked after some conflict. The former handyman later revealed a shocking truth. She had become obscenely wealthy. According to him, she had claimed the lives of 42 men, amassing fortunes ranging from $1,000 to $32,000 from each victim. By the time she vanished, she had accumulated over $250,000 through her deadly schemes. Just so you know, that's over $6 million today. Over the years, alleged sightings of Belle Gunness cropped up across the country, fueling speculation about her whereabouts, but none was ever confirmed. Investigations into her bank accounts yielded little, save for a small amount remaining in one of her savings accounts. Meanwhile, at the murder site, a headless female corpse was discovered, and while some considered it to be Belle's, this was never confirmed. In a bid to unravel the truth, forensic anthropologists and graduate students from the University of Indianapolis exhumed the headless body on November 5, 2007, with the permission of Bell's descendants. Their hope rested on a sealed envelope flap found at the victim's farm, potentially containing DNA that could be compared to the body. Regrettably, the DNA proved insufficient, leaving the identity of the enigmatic headless corpse unresolved, a chilling mystery that endures to this day. Shashikala Ramesh Patankar Take a look at this face. You're probably thinking she's that regular middle-aged woman in your neighborhood, but nothing could be further from the truth. Listen, if one single human could be blamed for sending 8 out of 10 Mumbai drug addicts to rehab, this is the person. Shashikala Ramesh Patankar, aka Baby, is a name that sends shivers down the spines of those familiar with Mumbai's drug underworld. At first, she was into selling milk, but later she dabbled into drugs, and what began as a small-time drug peddling operation transformed her into a notorious figure, reigning over the city's drug circuit for for as long as 15 years. But how did it all start? Well, born Shashikala Mazgaonkar into a family of six, she was nicknamed Baby, which is probably due to the fact that she's the only girl in the family. Until 1985, she made money selling milk bottles in Worli, South Mumbai. Her brothers who stayed close earned a living as drivers. Now, according to a nephew of hers named Manish Mazgaonkar, Shashikala met a local drug peddler in 1985 and decided that dealing drugs would be better for her. But how or why was she meeting a drug dealer? It turned out that her husband husband and brother were both drug addicts. 
It was she who orchestrated their supply, thus delving deeper into the realm of narcotics. In the year 2000, she established connections with drug dealers from Rajasthan, employing a cunning tactic to smuggle contraband into the city. She concealed the illegal substances on her stomach, skillfully hidden beneath layers of clothing, as she brazenly transported the illicit cargo through trains. And thus, she began growing her criminal business. In fact, rumors suggest that Patankar had deep connections with the Mumbai police. But then, between 2000 and 2000, 2002, the Mumbai police filed three cases against her for narcotics possession. Yet, despite being arrested on each occasion, she managed to secure bail and elude justice. Soon after her release after the second arrest, Patankar took an unexpected turn in her criminal journey, transforming herself into a police informer. A lookout notice was issued by the Mumbai police once again, this time linked to the arrest of Constable Dharmaraj Kaloke in the drug possession case. She operated as a middlewoman procuring drugs from dealers to sell in Mumbai revealed an officer with insider knowledge. Cunningly, she would retain a portion of the pure narcotics for herself, while adulterating the rest with inferior substances, known as ta'aka, in the underworld. When returning the diluted contraband to the original dealer, she claimed it was unsellable due to its poor quality. Seizing the opportunity, she would tip off the police, leading to the arrest of the unsuspecting dealers. This method earned Patankar a fearsome reputation in Rajasthan and the regions of Ratlam, Bawani Mandi, and Nimak in Madhya Pradesh, as she ensnared numerous drug peddlers within the clutches of the law. According to Mumbai police sources, she has accumulated properties worth over a billion Indian rupees from her thriving narcotics business over the past four years. After years of searching for her with no success, she was later caught in 2015, but soon enough, she was released again. But since then, Patankar's troubles have only multiplied. The Dadar police recorded the statement of her nephew, Manish Majankar, who alleges that Patankar was involved in his mother's murder back in 1993. At this moment, no one knows where she is. Judy Buenoano. Born Judius Welty, her troubled journey began in Texas with her parents. At the tender age of 14, her violent tendencies surfaced, leading her down a dark path that eventually landed her in prison for a brutal attack on her own family. After her release, she sought redemption through reform school and eventually became a nursing assistant. Life seemed to settle down when she gave birth to her son Michael in 1961. The following year, she married an Air Force officer named James Goodyear, and together they built a life in Orlando, raising their children. Tragically, James fell victim to mysterious symptoms upon his return from Vietnam, and he passed away. Little did anyone suspect that Judy was the mastermind behind his demise, collecting substantial sums from his insurance policies. But Judy's thirst for insurance money was insatiable. In 1971, her own house mysteriously went up in flames, conveniently providing her with additional funds. Soon after, she began a relationship with Bobby Joe Morris, who tragically suffered the same mysterious fate as James. The pattern was becoming unmistakable. Her son Michael, who joined the army, also fell victim to his mother's sinister plans. On his way to his new station, he stopped to visit Judy, only to experience a rapid decline in health. Doctors discovered alarming levels of arsenic in his blood, leaving him weak and eventually discharged from the military. In 1980, during a canoe trip, tragedy struck again. Judy, James, and Michael found themselves fighting for their lives as the canoe capsized. While Judy and James managed to reach safety, Michael, burdened by his metal leg braces, met a tragic end. Seizing the opportunity, Judy collected a hefty sum from his military life insurance policy. Undeterred by the horror she had caused, Judy opened a beauty salon and found a new love interest in John Gentry, a Florida businessman. Their engagement seemed like a new beginning, but it was far from it. Judy convinced John to take out life insurance policies on each other, cleverly setting the stage for her next sinister act. She administered pills laced with arsenic under the guise of special vitamins, slowly poisoning her unsuspecting fiancé. Still, the man survived and stopped taking the vitamins. However, he didn't know that Judy was the one behind it all, so he continued with her while she crafted a new plan. Next thing we know, John's car mysteriously exploded. Luckily, the man survived again, but this this time, the police were tipped off and began to unravel the web of deception surrounding her. Examinations and investigations uncovered a string of victims. Her son Michael, her first husband James Goodyear, and her former lover Bobby Joe Morris, all poisoned by her wicked hand. In 1984, justice finally caught up with Judy Buenoano. She was convicted for the murder of Michael and the attempted murder of John Gentry. 
A year later, she was also found guilty of James Goodyear's murder. Her punishment was a 12-year sentence for the Gentry case, a life sentence for Michael's case, and a death sentence for James's case. In 1998, at the age of 54, Judy Buenoano became a chilling statistic, Florida's first woman executed since 1848 and the third woman executed in the United States since the reinstatement of the death penalty in 1976. Her reign of terror had come to an end, but the memory of her cold-blooded crimes would forever remain. Maria Liziardi Among the rival factions of the Italian Mafia families of the late 1990s, the name Maria Liziardi stood out. She was a woman of Neapolitan origin in her late 40s. She rose to become the leader of the formidable Secondigliano clan, one of the most influential families within the Camorra in the streets of Naples. Liziardi's journey to power began in the Secondigliano section of northern Naples, where she was born in 1951. From 1993 to 2001, she steadily asserted her authority within the Camorra, taking advantage of the opportunities presented by the arrests, imprisonment, and demise of male figures in the syndicate. This period marked a significant shift as women started assuming leadership roles within the organization. When her two brothers, Pietro and Vincenzo, as well as her husband, Antonio Tegemi, were apprehended by the authorities, she seized the reins of control as the Madrina, or godmother of the Secondigliano clan. Lisiardi's shrewdness and practicality served her well as she oversaw various illegal activities, including prostitution, drug trafficking, cigarette smuggling, extortion, and other illicit enterprises. In a world dominated by men, she engaged in conversations, debates, and took decisive action on par with her male counterparts. During the late 1990s, Liziardi achieved a remarkable feat by earning the trust and respect of the bosses, known as guapos, from 20 rival criminal gangs within the Camorra. Employing her skills as a negotiator, she skillfully convinced them that unity and cooperation would yield greater profits and prevent needless bloodshed. Her influence held sway over Naples, leading to a brief respite from mob-related violence in the city. However, this newfound peace was short-lived. A violent conflict erupted over a significant heroin shipment from Istanbul. Recognizing the danger posed by the impure and lethal drugs, Lisiardi made the fateful decision to reject the supply, ordering its return. The Lo Russo clan, a rival faction, defied her authority, seized the drugs, and distributed the deadly powder in small packets. Tragically, the potent heroin claimed the lives of nearly a dozen addicts who succumbed to its deadly effects on the streets of Naples. The public outcry and media attention surrounding these deaths prompted the police to apprehend several known criminals. The fragile alliance Lisiardi had worked so hard to forge crumbled, leading to a wave of rebellion among rival Camorra clans. Within eight days, her clan suffered multiple casualties, including the loss of one of her nephews. In the face of such adversity, Lisiardi retaliated fiercely, deploying her gunmen to avenge her people. At least 14 were declared dead as a result of her vengeance. According to police reports, though, she's believed to be responsible for the deaths of at least 30 people. At this time, the Neapolitan police were determined to bring Lisiardi to justice and began pursuing her with an arrest warrant in 1999. Even after successfully raiding 13 Mafia bosses, she still managed to escape. It was in 2001 that she was finally arrested when cops pulled over a car in Naples and were surprised to see her there. She was later sentenced to 13 years in prison and has remained in jail ever since. Samantha Luthwaite Born and raised in Aylesbury, England, in an Irish Catholic military family, Samantha Luthwaite was initially described as a quiet, calm, normal girl by acquaintances. But all that started to change little by little after the separation of her parents in 1994. Friends would later report that she was goodly affected by the breakup and sought solace from Muslim neighbors. She believed that Muslims had a better and stronger family network, and during her teenage years, she decided to convert to Islam. This was a significant change in her life, but then she did not exhibit any radical tendencies. Luthwaite's life took a drastic turn in 2005 when she met and married Jermaine Lindsay, whom she had met online. Lindsay was one of the suicide bombers involved in the July 7, 2005, attacks on the London Underground, where he killed himself and 26 passengers. Initially, Luthwaite condemned the attack and expressed shock at her husband's involvement. However, subsequent events raised suspicions about Luthwaite's knowledge and involvement in terrorism. After Lindsay's death, she went into hiding with her children, cutting off contact with her family. Her movements became difficult to trace, and there were rumors that she used a fake passport and assumed the name Natalie Webb to raise funds and establish connections in various countries, including Pakistan, Somalia, Johannesburg, and the UK. In 2012, Interpol issued an arrest warrant for Luthwaite for a 2011 explosives possession charge. 
Authorities also suspected her involvement in multiple attacks carried out by the terrorist group Al-Shabaab, including a 2012 grenade attack in Mombasa and the 2013 attack on a shopping mall in Nairobi. While there is no concrete evidence implicating her as a mastermind, authorities believe she may have played a significant role in these acts. She became known as the White Widow during this time and gained notoriety as a radicalized terrorist. She's accused of being responsible for the deaths of over 400 people, and so she's regarded as public enemy number one. But despite efforts to apprehend her, Samantha Luthwaite is nowhere to be found. First, there were rumors in 2014 that she had been killed by a Russian sniper, but no one could verify the claims. Later, she was believed to be hiding in Kenya or Somalia, but this is also speculation. However, in 2022, her uncle said he believed she was dead, but then two security analysts stated that she was most likely being provided for at a remote location in either Tanzania or Somalia. Whether any of these is correct, no one seems to know, but the fact remains that the White Widow is yet to answer for her crimes. Amelia Dyer Amelia Dyer was a notorious baby farmer and serial killer in Victorian England from 1837 to 1896. This woman is so dangerous she is considered one of the most prolific murderers in British history. Now in case you're wondering what baby farming is, it was a practice in which women would adopt unwanted children for a fee, often promising to provide them with a safe and loving home. But of course, this was rarely ever the case as the children were neglected, mistreated, or even killed. Dyer initially trained as a nurse and a midwife before turning to baby farming as a lucrative trade. She would often let the children die from starvation and neglect using opium-laced syrup to keep them quiet. This syrup is called mother's friend, and that's exactly what it's not. Eventually, Dyer resorted to faster methods of murder to increase her profits. She managed to evade authorities for years until a suspicious doctor reported the high number of infant deaths under her care. Dyer was arrested and charged with neglect, receiving a sentence of six months of labor. However, upon her release, she returned to baby farming, this time avoiding involvement with physicians and disposing of the bodies herself to minimize suspicion. She frequently changed her location and used aliases to avoid detection. Dyer's crimes were eventually exposed when an infant's body found in the Thames River was traced back to her alias, Mrs. Thomas. When authorities searched Dyer's residence, they discovered the smell of decomposing human remains, but somehow the bodies were not found. So the investigators went back to the river and discovered the evil that was overflowing under. Several more baby bodies were recovered there, each wrapped with white edging tape around their necks. Dyer infamously remarked that the white tape was how one could identify her victims. She was tried at the Old Bailey in 1896 where she pleaded insanity as her defense. The jury swiftly reached a guilty verdict in less than five minutes. Although she admitted to only one murder, it is estimated that Dyer likely killed between 200 and 400 children throughout her years of activity. On June 10, 1896, she was executed by hanging. You might also be interested in the fact that there have been speculations linking Amelia Dyer to Jack the Ripper, suggesting that Dyer's victims were the result of botched abortions. However, there is limited evidence to support this theory, and it remains largely unfounded. Inadina Arellano Felix Inadina Arellano Felix was born into a family involved in narco-trafficking in Mazatlan, Sinaloa, Mexico, on April 12, 1961. Her parents were Benjamin Francisco Arellano Sanchez and Norma Alicia Felix Zazueta, and she had six brothers and one sister, all of whom were actively involved in the drug trade. At the age of 16, Inadina aspired to become a Mazatlan carnival queen. However, her dream was shattered when it was revealed that her two brothers, Ramon and Benjamin, were being sought by the United States and Mexican governments for their drug dealings. Inadina pursued higher education and enrolled at a private university in Guadalajara, Jalisco, where she earned a bachelor's degree in accounting. By the mid-1980s, she was already involved in the family's business, including money laundering activities for the cartel. Following the arrest of Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, the founder of the Guadalajara cartel and a relative of her brothers, the Tijuana cartel, aka the Arellano Felix organization was born. Founded by the Arellano Felix family, the Tijuana cartel was once regarded as one of the largest and most violent criminal groups in Mexico. Initially, Enadina Arellano Felix assisted her brothers with money laundering and financial management of the cartel. However, after the untimely deaths and incarcerations of her brothers, she eventually assumed leadership of the cartel. In particular, after the arrest of her brother Eduardo Arellano Felix by the Mexican Federal Police on October 26, 2008, the Tijuana cartel became increasingly inactive, leading to Enadina Arellano Felix taking full control of the organization. With the assistance of her nephew Luis Fernando, she became the supreme leader of the cartel and oversaw all its operations. 
As a well-educated woman, she handled the business better and was able to avoid the pitfalls that led to the ruin of her brothers. According to Robert Castillo, a former special agent who headed the El Paso DEA office, even before she took over as the leader, members of the cartel referred to her as La Jefa, meaning the boss. One of the things she did differently from her brothers was that she used a more discreet approach and avoided resorting to violence. She maintained a low profile and has even formed alliances with other criminal organizations to ensure the smooth operation of the drug business while minimizing conflicts. According to officials from the Drug Enforcement Administration DEA, and the Mexican media, Enadina Arellano Felix is one of the few female leaders to head a drug cartel. Her historical contacts with drug suppliers in Colombia have helped to sustain the organization's operations to this day. Parker Bonney Do not fall for the romanticized imagery that entertainers have given to Bonnie and Clyde. That couple was as evil as a couple could be, but then again, Bonnie Parker was quite a character. Born on October 1, 1910, in Rowena, Texas, to Henry and Emma Parker, Bonnie looked nothing like the woman she turned out to be. After her father's death in 1914, the family moved to West Dallas, and there Bonnie excelled as an honor student in school. She even had a passion for writing poetry and reading romance novels. But despite her petite stature, standing at 4 feet 10 and weighing only 85 pounds, she would become a legendary criminal figure. Bonnie first met Clyde Barrow in January 1930, and their romantic involvement began shortly thereafter. However, their relationship was put on hold when Clyde was imprisoned just a month later. During his incarceration, Bonnie wrote letters pleading with him to stay out of trouble, but then in early March, she smuggled a pistol into his cell, which he used to escape after causing a lot of trouble. But then again, he was recaptured after a robbery in Middleton. Town, Ohio, and sent to Easton Prison Farm in Crockett, Texas in 1930. Now, Clyde was released in February 1932, but this time he came out with a stronger desire for destruction. And as for Bonnie, she was more determined than ever to prove her loyalty to him. Thus, she adopted his criminal lifestyle, and together they gave birth to chaos. Bonnie and Clyde embarked on a constant journey, traveling through several states including Texas, Kansas, Iowa, Oklahoma, Missouri, New Mexico, Arkansas, and Illinois. Their criminal activities intensified over time, and their encounters with the law became increasingly violent. In June, June 1933, Bonnie was severely burned when their car overturned near Wellington, Texas, but she was treated at a nearby farmhouse. During their crime spree, they kidnapped officials sent to investigate the incident and later released them in Oklahoma. In Alma, Arkansas, they killed the town marshal. In Platte City, Missouri, Clyde's brother was killed and his sister-in-law was taken into custody. In January 1934, Bonnie and her man aided their accomplice, Raymond Hamilton, in escaping from Easton Prison Farm, resulting in the death of a guard. It was then that the head of the Texas prison system and the governor enlisted the services of former Texas Ranger Captain Francis Hamer to track down the couple. By mid-1934, Hamer and his team had started pursuing Bonnie and Clyde. One of the most brazen murders committed by the duo occurred on Easter Sunday in 1934 on the outskirts of Grapevine, Texas. They opened fire on two highway patrolmen who had stopped to check on their car, killing them. According to a witness, Bonnie walked over to one of the officers, rolled him over with her foot, and then fired two more shots at his head at point-blank range, exclaiming, Look at there, his head bounced just like a rubber ball. Less than a week later, Bonnie and Clyde killed a constable in Commerce, Oklahoma, marking their final murder. From that point on, Bonnie and Clyde were in constant flight, pursued by law enforcement. They were eventually ambushed near their hideout at Black Lake, Louisiana, on May 23, 1934 in the morning and were killed in a hail of 167 bullets. Bonnie's body was found with numerous bullet wounds, holding a machine gun, a sandwich, and a pack of cigarettes. Clyde was barely recognizable, clutching a revolver. The car they were driving was taken to Arcadia, Louisiana, and their bodies were later delivered to Dallas. Ma Barker Ma Barker, originally known as Arizona Donnie Clark, was born on October 8, 1873 in Ash Grove, Missouri. She later changed her name to Kate Barker. Her parents, Emmeline and John Clark, were immigrants from Scotland and Ireland. After her father's death when she was seven years old, her mother remarried to Reuben Reynolds, a lawman. Kate did not get along with her stepfather and felt mistreated compared to her step-siblings. As a rebellious child, Kate became fascinated with the outlaws of the Midwest, particularly the Dalton Gang. She would read magazine articles about their bank and train robberies. Her interest in notorious criminals like Jesse James would play a significant role in her life. So when the Great Depression struck, she, along with her sons, formed the Barker Carpus Gang. 
This gang would go on to become the most notorious criminal organization of the time. Just so you know how crazy that is, this was a time when other criminals such as Vern Miller, John Dillinger, and Bonnie and Clyde were making their runs too. But what's even more incredible is that the Barker Carpus gang managed to steal more money than the aforementioned criminals combined. In fact, five members of the Barker family were among the most wanted criminals on the FBI's list in the 1930s. Kate, known as Ma Barker, is believed to have been the driving force behind the gang's violent activities in the Midwest. What makes Ma Barker unique in criminal history is that she was never arrested, fingerprinted, or photographed while committing a crime. There was no physical evidence directly linking her to specific criminal activities. However, she controlled a gang of around two dozen members who carried out her orders. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover described her as a domineering, clever woman who coldly and methodically planned the abduction of two of the nation's wealthiest men. And who were these men? The first was a millionaire Minnesota brewer named William Ham Jr. in 1933. They received $100,000 in ransom, after which they released the man unharmed. Just a year later, they kidnapped St. Paul banker Edward George Bremer. Being a bigger person, they asked for double the earlier price and got not just the money, but the nation's attention. Bremer, who was a friend of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, talked about the incident on FDR's famous fireside chats, Ma Barker's criminal. Activities spanned over 20 years, during which she meticulously planned and organized her gang's actions. Another thing she organized was the church attendance of her four sons, Herman, Lloyd, Arthur, and Fred. But it all came to an end on January 16, 1935. Cops were able to uncover the location of the gang family after capturing Arthur Barker, so they tracked them down to their Florida house. After surrounding the house, the family was given a chance to surrender, but instead, they opened fire. Thus, the cops returned fire using machine guns, tear gas bombs, and so on. It didn't take long for cars full of high school students in the area to pull up to watch the gunfight. And what a scene it was as the gunfight lasted for four hours, the longest in the FBI's history. According to reports, it was a single bullet that killed Ma Barker as she died with a machine gun in her left hand. Griselda Blanco, a.k.a. La Dama de la Mafia, Griselda Blanco Restrepo, a.k.a. La Dama de la Mafia, which means Lady of the Mafia, was born on February 15, 1943 in Colombia. Her childhood was marked by abandonment and abuse. After being abandoned by her father, she was taken to Medellin, where she grew up in poverty-stricken conditions and suffered severe physical abuse from her mother, who was reportedly an alcoholic prostitute. At a young age, Blanco found herself living on the streets where she met her first husband and mentor, Carlos Trujillo. Together, they eventually made their way illegally into New York City in the mid to late 1960s. In her 20s, Blanco started engaging in criminal activities ranging from pickpocketing and forging fake ID documents to involvement in the drug trade. Little by little, she rose until she gained notoriety as the godmother of the drug business in Miami. Over the course of 37 years, her reputation as one of Colombia's most notorious drug lords grew alongside other infamous figures like Pablo Escobar and Carlos Later of the Medellin cartel. Griselda Blanco was responsible for numerous murders, including those of her three husbands and countless others who crossed her path. Blanco's violent tendencies and ruthless tactics earned her the fear and respect of her contemporaries. She surrounded herself with a group of henchmen known as the Pistoleros, who were required to kill someone and provide proof of the act by presenting a body part. Blanco's reputation for violence reached its peak during the Dadeland Massacre in July 1979, a particularly bloody event that took place in a Miami shopping center. This chain of events led to the death of drug kingpin German Jimenez Paneso, his bodyguard, and five other people. Her crimes and the ruthless methods she used made her a prime target for law enforcement agencies. So, on February 17, 1985, she was arrested in her home by the DEA and charged with several crimes. Now she was initially sentenced to 15 years in prison, but another three counts of second-degree murder charge earned her 20-year sentences, which were to run concurrently. Still, she was released in 2004 after suffering a heart attack in prison in 2002. Nonetheless, karma finally caught up with her on September 3, 2012, at the age of 69. She was buying meat at a butcher shop in Medellin when she was shot to death by a motorcyclist. After death, Blanco became the subject of fascination in popular culture, with portrayals of her character appearing in several TV shows and films. Now we've learnt about the 10 most dangerous female criminals. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like and subscribe button. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then hit the next one showing on your screen, because there, we take it all to the next level.